thank you so much for leading this today, Venerable Yinten, and thank you all, all of you who've joined us via Zoom and in the Gompa. This month, today, uh, we are discussing compassionate communication, um, which was really dealing with different responses to COVID-19. Um, next month in November, uh, it will be on psychology and Buddhism, December, harmonious holidays, and January, breaking bad habits, which is very much in align with our thoughts during those months. So we appreciate that, Venerable Yintin. Thanks, Christina. I appreciate it. And um, there's a few folks here in the Gompa that, and there's a few folks online and we'll just kind of pretend that we're all in it together because we really are. So this course is very much about your inner work. Okay, so we're talking about COVID-19. We're talking about the pandemic. This is very present for us. We all have different experiences of it. We all have a different relationship with it. Um, some of us have had a easy and peaceful lockdown. Some of us have had a very stressful lockdown. Some of us agree that it should happen. Some of us disagree that it should happen. Some of us are very happy that there's a vaccine. Some of us are very afraid of the vaccine or angry at the approach of it. There's a million opinions. And we know that there's a million opinions. And that's part of what makes things tense. Yeah, it's, it's part of, you know, an already difficult situation is harder for us because there's not like a unified view. There's not like, here is the enemy that we will all work together to fight against because there's doubt even about what the entity of the enemy is and what the approach should be. And in this course or in this public talk today, what I really want us to do is look within about our own approach to when we find a differing view. When we meet someone that we don't agree with, what is the skillful approach? What is the compassionate approach? Not, how do I fix them? How do I change them? Now, it might be that the view that someone holds, you perceive to be quite a dangerous view, a view that really you feel in your heart needs to be changed. But what we're wanting to look at here today is how to step back from that fear and ask yourself, does it help them change their mind for me to be freaked out and want to change it? <laughs> Does it actually help someone find new information if we give it to them? Or actually, does when we give people information, it makes them freak out and overwhelmed and dig their heels in and believe what they believe even more strongly? So we want to ask ourselves what's effective, what's skillful, what actually works in opening hearts and minds, as opposed to what we wish were the case or what works for us specifically, assuming what works for us works for everyone. When obviously that's not the case, but we kind of default to, well, if I was needing to change my mind, here's the approach that would work for me, I'll try it on them. Oh, it doesn't work. They're a lost cause, I will cut them out of my life. Good riddance, you know, that can happen. Yeah. So before we even kind of get into it, let's just do a really gentle guided reflection. Okay, so this is completely about your own inner work, about your own interviews, about how you worked it with differences of opinion. So it's somewhere between an analysis and a meditation, but approach it as if it's a meditation and just kind of like get yourself sat in a way that you can listen to your inner narrative and really be honest about what you think about things. So whatever our view is, the underlying premise is May this practice be for the greater good. Okay. So just start with when there is a difference of opinion, what is my own response? Whether it's COVID or something completely easy and not controversial, if it's just a very simple difference of opinion, in general, how do you deal with differences of opinion? and become more specific and ask, under what circumstances do I feel threatened by differing views? Just do a deep dive using your memory, using your knowledge of yourself. When do you feel afraid or threatened when someone has a differing view?
where does the threat seem to come from? Who exactly is under threat? Mm. Just, just kind of unpack where those opinions come from or where that sense comes from for you. Is the fear more likely if I feel like I'm not totally informed or smart enough to make my argument? Is that when I'm more afraid of differing views? Just checking in may or may not be the case, but is the fear trigger or the sense of being threatened likely there? Is the fear more likely if I feel like I am very informed and I'm afraid of the impact of other people's ignorance? That you feel quite certain that you have more information and it's their problematic thinking that's freaking you out. Is that more likely for you as an individual? Under what circumstances do I feel ready to consider changing my mind? Are there ever circumstances where I'm open to being wrong and also being corrected? Is there any case? Not talking about the biggest opinions or the, the deepest views, but just even in everyday life, are we open to correction? Do we keep an idea that we might be wrong? Am I open to changing my mind? Maybe when I feel curious about new information, is that a case where I'm a bit more open? For some reason, the content is less loaded or less emotional, less problematic, and you're just interested or curious. Does that help you have an openness to changing a view? Or is it when you want to please the other person and maintain the relationship, you're willing to change your mind for the sake of your connection, or at least pretend to do so? Does that ever come up? Whether you think that's a good idea or a bad idea, does it ever come up? You just become agreeable because it's easier that way.
Are you more likely to change your mind when you feel safe and not judged? Do I feel more open to changing my mind when I find new information on my own or if someone I trust explains it? It's just an exercise of self-knowledge. Are you more likely to trust yourself and your own research? Are you more likely to trust someone you consider to be an expert? Just examine what it's like for you. Okay, so just relax your attention for a minute. And just sitting with that, yeah, not talking about a specific topic, but just thinking in general, how often do we actually change our minds about anything? Regardless of, you know, the pressure on it or the importance of it, how often do we actually change our mind? And I think it's so important if we're meeting someone with a differing view to acknowledge how difficult it is to change our mind about anything. And I think it helps to use an example. So an example I like is take something that generally polite people agree on, okay? Which is we all agree it's nice to return your shopping cart to the shopping corral after doing your groceries and putting them in the car. Do we all generally agree it's nice to put your shopping cart back in the shopping corral, right? Generally speaking, yeah. And of course there are days um, that we might be lazy or there are days that we might not know where this shopping corral is or we might be a teenager who's a bit of a snot, but generally speaking, we agree, put the trolley back, put the shopping cart back, yeah? Okay, so what if all of your adult life you've held that belief and it was reinforced by many things? And then you went to a new shopping center and they had hired someone maybe with a developmental disability who their job was to run around and gather shopping carts that hadn't been put in the corral and put them there. And that was their job. And that was all that they could really cope with in their job. And it was so empowering for them to have a useful task. And so you're going to put your shopping trolley away. See, I'm going between shopping trolley and shopping cart because I just came from Australia. <laughs> click, click, cart. Can we call it a cart? What do yeah. we call it? Yeah, okay, <laughs> so, so it's going, you're taking it back and then someone corrects you and says, no, actually here, here, we don't put our shopping trolleys away. We don't put our shopping carts away. And they kind of say it a little bit snooty, like you should know this. We're a little bit different here. Yeah, so we're a little different here. We don't put our things away. No, we are, we are altruistic saviors of humanity and we employ people with developmental disabilities and you are ruining their empowered feeling of putting shopping carts away. Yeah, and imagine like how you would feel, right? Be like, oh, I feel so terrible. I don't wanna disempower anyone. I don't wanna do the wrong thing. Okay, okay. And so you do what the crowd wants you to do but then the next time you come to that shopping center, you may or may not remember. You might do your same old thing of putting it back, or you might leave it out, or you might leave it out in a performative way, like everyone, look, I'm doing the right thing. There, there's a lot of different things that can happen, but part of you is a little ashamed about not knowing better. Even though, why would you? Why would you know better? It's a whole different system. It's a whole different set of information. But because of that shame of I should have known this or I went against the herd or I went against the pack, that cringe, even when you adjust something very minor, makes you a little bit fragile. 
it makes you a little defensive. And if you had just been corrected and then you went into the shopping center and you found that, um, I don't know, it was a whole different setup and things weren't where you're used to finding them, you'd be even more unsettled. Yeah, where are the eggs? I can't find the eggs. And they're like, no, we don't do eggs here. And why would you even ask? And don't you know that we are um, all vegans here? And how dare you? <laughs> right? How dare you? And you're like, but I was going to get the free range ones. I was going to get the happy ones. And I didn't think chickens even cared about their eggs most of the time. Oh, no, I'm bad. I'm bad. Right? Like shame, flood, whatever. Right? And then you get home. And whoever you live with tells you off about something in the household you know, you didn't put the dishes away or whatever. Like that kind of tension builds and builds and builds so much so that you might actually dig your heels in about something irrelevant. Yeah, you dig your heels in and become stubborn about something that you believe, even if generally you'd be open to changing your mind. You're just like fed up with being told off. Yeah, do you know that feeling of when you're just you're fed up about people criticizing you and telling you you're wrong so you just kind of hunker down in your beliefs and there is nothing that will change your mind once you get into that state it doesn't matter how logical yeah you're you're it's just going to reinforce whatever views you have because your view right now is i'm under attack yeah so when we're trying to open hearts and minds an attack is not the effective way Info dumping is not the effective way. And actually we should start the conversation with, I might be wrong. <laughs> yeah, but it has to be genuinely, I might be wrong. And none of us really believe we might be wrong. Yeah. And, and so how do you feel your way into a genuine openness of, I might be wrong and that doesn't make me bad. It doesn't make me stupid. It doesn't make me anything except for missing a piece of information. And missing a piece of information is not a moral issue. It's just, it, I haven't come across it yet. So even if you're pretty sure that your view is correct, if you're trying to connect with someone with a differing view, you have to hold open the space in your heart genuinely that is ready to receive more information. Yeah, even if you're gonna kind of hold your opinion, you have to hold it lightly. Otherwise, what's the point in ever talking about it? It's just gonna be two people hitting their heads together. So you're like inviting a possibility of new information by you being the first one to open the door to it. And if they're giving you information that you don't agree with or you know to be wrong from your own logic experience research, you're still trying to keep that open mind that knows it is very hard to change our minds. Once we finally come to a conclusion or a belief, it's very hard to change our minds. And so what is more important than harmony? Very few things. Very few things are more important than harmony. And in order to get out of that defensive space, you have to really accept the possibility that you might be wrong and that they, or that they will never change their mind and that none of those are the ingredients necessary to stay kind, to stay compassionate, to even stay in some sort of relationship. There are a few things that are a big enough deal in terms of a moral issue that you might say we have to part ways. But I think we have the tendency to do the nuclear option and say, I must take a stand for all mankind and cut you out of my life because I don't like your view about this. You know, like it's saying something about you as a person. And there are a few instances where that might need to happen. I'm not saying there aren't. There are a few things that are extreme enough that you have to say to someone, you're out. Yeah, until you fix this, you are out. And even if you do fix it, it might be the damage in the relationship in the family is too much to welcome you back here, but I'm not gonna get all kind of punitive about it and retaliate because that's not how I roll, right? But you know, there are very few things that are a big enough deal to say out of my life forever. Yeah. So when we're looking at these things, I think it's useful to look at the Buddhist framework of logic. So there's one logical set that we do in Buddhism, which I think is really interesting. And this is called looking at the four possibilities. Okay, so with anything, like we're just taking this as an example. Take whatever it is that you're hung up on. You can run it through the filter of the four possibilities. So you can ask, is it a logistical issue? Is it a moral issue? 
Is it both a logistical and a moral issue or is it neither? Yeah, so basically, is it A, is it B, is it both A and B or neither A and B? Because once you kind of like get your head around that, then you can start unpacking what is skillful action. Okay, so then you ask yourself, what are my emotions like in each case? Okay, so if this is just a logistical issue, am I more likely to be relaxed about it? Yeah, if it's just a manner of strategizing and making plans and just kind of getting things into place, am I more likely to be kind of chilled out about that because that's my personality or the way I learn things? Or do logistics kind of freak me out because there's too many moving parts and too many details and they make me feel overwhelmed? Because either could be the case and either would make sense depending on the person's context. So it's an exercise of self-knowing. Am I more, I guess, upregulated? Am I more agitated if I'm seeing this as a logistical issue? Then you look, okay, is it a moral issue? Might be a moral issue, might not be a moral issue. From whose perspective is it a moral issue? For you, check. If this argument or this difference of opinion for you strikes a moral chord of this is wrong or this is right, are you more likely to be upregulated, overly emotional, and shut down to reasoning? Or are you more likely to have a heart-opened experience, a want to connect, and kind of um, see your way through whatever differences of opinion because you treasure the relationship? And either instance could be true. It's an exercise of self-knowledge. For you, what is the emotional response if it's seen as a moral issue? And if it's both or if it's neither, but you're just kind of sharpening the horns of the dilemma in your head. So you're not so overwhelmed by the, with the feeling of, I don't know what to do. This is too much. You're not in alignment with the rest of my friends. It's too hard, just go. Yeah, you're trying not to get yourself to that nuclear option of just F off, right? Cause that is not healthy. And that's not the way into a harmonious society or a way to logistically problem solve stuff. Cause you're never gonna get everyone to agree about stuff. Does that mean you can't have a harmonious society? Yeah. So you're just checking in now, what is my effectiveness in either case? And if your effectiveness is more likely to be there, if it's a logistical issue, choose to frame it that way. If you're gonna be more effective, if it's a moral issue, choose to frame it that way. Cause there's an argument for either case, yeah. But the background of that is you knowing I chose whether to make it a logistical issue or a moral issue. That was my choice. It wasn't inherently that from its own side. Or I decided I'm going to see that there's an argument for both and I'm going to hold those parallel things in my mind because moving back and forth between them is going to kind of keep me on track to not get too intellectual or too squishy, loosey-goosey about stuff. If I hold that both are the case, it's going to keep me in line. And if it's neither, then we have to kind of go back to square one and check, well, what is it then? Yeah. So is it sort of making sense? These four possibilities, is it A? Is it B? Is it both? Is it neither? And then once you kind of sort that out for yourself, you ask, what's going to be my response given that? What's going to be my way forward given that? And some of this is just kind of checking in with in the past, when you have helped a community, where were you operating from? You know, were you more effective when you were heart centered or were you more effective when you were head centered? Because it's really individual. You know, some of us have really worked on our communication skills in the logic area and the strategic area. And people can say things that are really obnoxious and rude and it just bounces right off because we're just in, let's be practical. Yeah, when you're in that mode, just let's just be practical. That was rude, that was um, unskillful, that was misinformed, that was illogical, but none of that matters because we're just trying to get the job done. If you know that you operating from a logical perspective maintains harmony, sit in that place, speak from that place. If you know that you've done a lot of work on your heart, right, on compassionate communication, on being patient, in acknowledging the suffering of people with any kind of view, then you speak from that place. But it has to be something that's not going into 
a codependent mishmash of boundaryless yuckiness. Yes, technical term, right? <laughs> technical term. You know, you're not going into people pleasing. You're not going into everybody like me, everybody like each other. Not like squishy, yucky compassion, but like empowered compassion that genuinely wants everyone to feel and be safe. Feel and be safe, regardless of their view. So, so if you were to just kind of sit with yourself, I'm guessing we each have a time when head-centered works and heart-centered works. And eventually we want to kind of be able to be flexible and move between the two really organically. Um, but what does that require? Yeah, to be able to have flexibility in every communication style, to be able to be strategic and heart opened. What does that require from you as an individual? What do you think? Just guessing. Yeah, it, it means inner work. It means self-awareness. It means managing your own reactivity. Yeah, we have to be able to manage our own reactivity. And that is a life's work, right? A lifetime's work. But if we are overly identified with our opinions, then a difference of opinion feels like a personal attack. And a lot of us were brought up to believe the personal is political, the political is personal, you should take things personally, because if you don't, you will never act. And there is a wisdom to that, in terms of getting people off their seats and into action to right wrongs, there's definitely an argument for that. But I would argue that that is a limited way. And we want to say that actually, to say something is more personal than something else might be an exaggeration that there's a way to view everything as personal or nothing as personal because everything is interconnected. So if someone differs with our view, they're not attacking us, even if they are attacking us. It's not you, your opinions are not you. You came to these opinions. And all of this communication stuff requires you being able to have a steady, calm mind so your whole life experience is accessible to you. We have so much wisdom from our life, just common sense wisdom, experiential wisdom. Maybe it's spiritually informed wisdom or religiously informed wisdom as well, or not. But we have wisdom, but we can't access it if we're agitated. If we're agitated, we default to our lizard brain, right? If we're agitated, we default to what worked one time that's fresh in your memory. And it's kind of hit and miss. If your mind is spacious and relaxed and calm, because you haven't taken anything personally, because you've managed your own reactivity, then you have your whole life's work in front of you. And you can say, I'm gonna choose this tool that I learned and apply it here. You can pick, yeah, does that make sense? Yeah. And if it fails, if your strategy fails, you're not so worried about it. You think, oh, I'm missing a piece of information. I'm missing a skill. I'm not having a primordial deficiency or a primordial badness. I just haven't learned a technique that would work here. Or here is a time when no technique would work. But it's not a failing, which means you haven't then ruined the potential for ongoing relationship with the person because of your quote failure, because you're not taking it personally. Yeah. So, so much of this is about context, isn't it? If we had lived the same exact lifetime as someone, we would come to very similar conclusions. And you think, yeah, but my siblings have different views than me and we all grew up the same. No, you didn't. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> no, you didn't. Oh, so-and-so is my best friend. We grew up in the same neighborhood. We're the same age. We, we, we have the same background, but totally different opinions. No, that's not true. Everybody's experience is unique. Everybody has had pain that has not been reconciled or integrated or shared or held. Everybody's got wounds that make them reactive. And our first job as people working to be compassionate is to hold open the space that there are many correct views and that there is a lot of ways of living life that are not the ways I live life, but could still be fine. Yeah. And then what about those instances where you feel like there is harm, there is something that needs to be addressed? 
you, this is one of those rare cases where actually this is dangerous, we need to talk about it. You're not making it so cosmic, like if I don't succeed in fixing this, all of the world will fall apart because things are not that catastrophic. Yeah, so you kind of have to make peace with this might not work before you even start and be okay with that. Yeah, and decide to not let that harden your heart because we don't have control of every single piece and we never will. The Buddhas don't have control of every single piece. Why would we? Yeah, so all of these are, things are to say, let yourself relax into lack of certainty relaxing into groundlessness because we have this illusion that we will feel great security and great stability once we get all the pieces together once we get our life in order once we have all our tools at at our fingertips and that will never be the case life is not so tidy as that it's much more practical to get really comfortable with uncertainty yeah and really comfortable with i'm not sure how this is going to work but either case is my path. We have lots of prayers in Buddhism where we say, whatever happens, happiness or suffering, may I take it on the path to enlightenment. If my life is happy, that's fuel for the path. If my life is unhappy, it's fuel for the path. If people love, agree with me, support me, that's fuel for the path. If they hate me, they despise me, they're criticizing me, that's fuel for the path. And what's more, all of it's changeable, all of it's impermanent, and what is happening right now will not be this way forever. That's neither good news nor bad news, but we could see it as good news. We could choose to see it as good news. Yeah. So that's that's the you know thought for the day. <laughs> um, what what questions do you have? Yeah, Christina. Um, what's coming up for me is is. So there, there's this idea of, of like the right and the wrong, right? Um, that I personally have struggled with. And so it's like that black and white, this is right, moral or not moral, or, or I should say immoral. Um, and and what came out of, uh, for, for many years is I finally got to this place of, okay, I'm, I'm gonna work very hard to let go of the right and wrong. But then there became a groundlessness from that. And so it kind of struck me when you use that word, because it, it became um, very like unsettling. Yeah. Um, and like I had nothing to stand on or grant, like to, 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 and so I'm just curious how for you, you, you contend with that, that feeling of groundlessness, because um, for me personally, it's just been a very unsettling place. And so I'm trying to work to be okay with the, like letting go of the right and wrong, but I just, I struggle with it very, very much so. Yeah, and it, it almost comes to the most profound philosophical point in Buddhism. You know, this very simple issue of how do I make peace with groundlessness actually comes into how do I reconcile emptiness and dependent arising? How do I reconcile the fact that everything lacks inherent existence? So there is no inherent right. There is no inherent wrong. They are only right or wrong contextually. Right, only various causes and conditions make something the right thing or the wrong thing. And even that label not existing from its own side. So that is true. Then how do you function? <laughs> how do you live in this world? And the lack of inherent existence does not negate ethics. Yeah, but ethics are contextual. So it's a razor's edge. It's the middle way is the hardest thing to land on but what you can keep doing is saying to yourself, I know to be true that positive beneficial actions lead to happiness, negative destructive actions lead to suffering for both myself and others. I know that cause and effect is true, but what that actually is in this moment, I have to stay flexible enough to not default or go into autopilot and just assume. I have to hold open even if this moment looks like a million moments before it, and this relationship looks like a million relationships before it, I need to have the freshness of perspective to see that there are new elements I haven't seen exactly in this formation before. So what is positive and what is negative has to be decided in the moment and then let go of and decide in the moment and let go of. And that's the comfort and the groundlessness is I want to work for the greater good. We want to work for the greater good. But that is an ever-shifting 
definition. What is the greater good anyway? So it's like, as soon as you lock down, you have to release. It's like, you have to come to opinions. You must come to opinions or you cannot function. Land on your opinion, land on your choice, but you land lightly. Yeah, this is how I'm gonna live until I get more information or until oh, new, more nuance oh, occurs, oh, right? Yeah, so that yeah. keeps you from being paralyzed. Yeah. You yeah. know? So, and it's very much the way the Tibetans do debate. Yeah. And in debate, you kind of just pick a position, <laughs> the right one or the wrong one. You just pick a position and then debate it and come to see if it holds water or not. And, you know, in the West, we have debate class, you know, um, that high school kids do, and it's very useful. And you can look at the stuff we grew up with, with, oh, that's, you know, that's a straw man fallacy, everybody, straw man fallacy. Yeah, that, <laughs> that's a false dichotomy, everyone. Yes, yes. Um, you know, and you can look at those things that you know to be true, but the point is to look at them within yourself and see that a lot of our choices are based in faith, even if there's some research information and logic there's a few leaps that we make with pretty much everything. Like mm -hmm. I get in a car and I drive it. I have a general idea how a car works, but I don't really know. I don't really know. I'm taking it on faith, <laughs> you know? And I know that if it makes a funny sound, I need to shift gears, you know, like, oh, that's the sound of going to fourth, you know? But like, how does that actually work? I don't know, I don't really know. I know that I could be taught, yeah? I know that it's explainable. And I know that there are people who do know how it works and I have trust in them generally, though it starts to fade as the years go by and more and more mechanics, you know, <laughs> deceive me. But, you know, like as time goes by, you know, the trust develops that it's a knowable entity. But I d that doesn't mean I've done the work of going through that knowledge, right? So there's faith at play with a lot of our choices. And I think that's where a lot of defensiveness comes in because if someone has a differing view it shows us how much we've held an idea based on some faith, not all reason. And so we're kind of like, oh, actually, I was just kind of thinking that's how vaccines work. I actually don't totally know how they work. I sort of know how they work. I remember eighth grade science, but do crap, I actually don't know. I'm going to have to read something. I don't know if I agree with you or not. I need to read something. And then you're like, who am I reading this from? Do I trust them? Oh, God, no. Oh. You know, and it's a whole thing. And so, so some of our defensiveness is just this like cringe of, I've been operating under a premise that does not totally have logic at its core. How embarrassing. Okay. Still, I can move forward with it. So it's like, you're not having your opinions so personal. It's like, makes sense given my life, open to new info. Gently, gently. Hi. Um... Everything that you talked about spoke to me. Um, the part about, um, I've gone through a period of time where I, I was told I was wrong and I actually had an open mind to say, you know what, let me look at that and I found myself, it was my professional work. And I've went through that kind of low and high and now I'm at a point where personally, I, I spoke to that point or I heard that point about hardening your heart and I have a hardened heart when it comes to family. And I am trying to, develop a new relationship with this in mind but I know I enter that relationship with people seeing me as the old person and um, what would be a kind of a general approach to to use this technique when people see me as hardened heart and I want, I want to be a new open yeah yeah open it's, a, it's a really good question did you guys hear her on zoom it, 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 the question was about you know how to keep an open heart when it's hardened at the res as the result of a lot of conflict in relationships and how to help people see you newly and freshly. And I think with any of these questions, the first question is, what is your goal? You know, what's the goal? And then you backtrack to what will get, help you achieve that goal. Because a very emotional state will make a very short-term solution. And the, the short-term solution is, please be nice to me and like me now and be welcoming in the way that you once did. The, you know, it's kind of a short-term knee-jerk solution and very understandable. But if you can kind of take a little step back and ask, what is my best case scenario long-term? Do I want a continued relationship with these people? Is there a benefit to that? 
a benefit to them, a benefit to me, a benefit for society as a whole? Is it good for us to be in each other's lives? And that's a question we might not have even asked. We're just so used to being in each other's lives. We assume it's the default, you know? So just kind of like open up the possibilities a little bit and ask, is this the best thing? And if it is, then you start to strategize with what actually helps you be seen in a different light, consistent behavior that is different than how they branded you. And it's gonna take twice as long as it seems like it should have and you've proved yourself a million times over, but if it's important enough to you, you just see it as part of the cause and you let go of expectations of how long it's gonna take. You know, just gently, gently. And, and I think it helps to see the benefit of the new situation because then it makes you less panicked about trying to force it into something else, yeah? And it might be able to go where you want it to go, but if you make peace with what is, then you kind of release the tension around it. Um, and I think that this kind of, for lack of a better word, energetic experience we have with each other in relationships is so subtle, but is so important to navigate, which is as soon as you have a need and a craving and a want from someone, they're going to recoil. Yeah, they're gonna pull back and say, back off i don't have what you want yeah even if i did a minute ago the the degree of your need is freaking me out i'm shutting the doors we are closed for business you know and as soon as you come to someone with i am fine as i am i am fine as you are nothing ever has to change then there can be change yeah but if you're coming in with the pressure of, I need to fix this, I need to change this, you need to change, you need to love me, blah, blah, blah. It suffocates all the possibilities because there's just too much pressure. Yeah, and that's part of like these conversations with people with different opinions is we suffocate the possibility for there to be any kind of change because there's just so much energetic pressure. Yeah, people aren't gonna change under those contexts. Yeah, they're going to hunker down and be even more what they were before because it's too much. Yeah, other other thoughts? Uh, I uh, you know, have a young daughter and I think a lot about what it must be like for her during this time and how, you know, all these people who have been in, you know, what we would look at as positions of authority really don't know. Yeah. You know, and, and that keeps showing up in all different ways. And so I think a lot about... Um, you know, in my personal relationship with her, how to help be a support and give her some foundation. But I also think sort of more globally about, you know, mm. what happens with this generation and how do they sort of proceed through life? And, you know, how can we as a, a community support them, um, you know, with this sort of knowledge that <laughs> whether it's just as a parent or the teacher, or you can just keep going, the answer continually is, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know good question, I don't know, and what that must feel like, you know, yeah. to have all these people around you saying, I don't know. Yeah, it's, it's a really important point. She, she was asking you about what's going to happen to this generation of kids who's surrounded by authority figures and parental figures who really honestly don't know a lot of the time and they're changing their minds all the time on the basis of various things all the time and what's it going to do to them. And I almost wonder, will it break the spell earlier? Yeah. You know, like, do you remember the time as a child where you suddenly realized adults don't know what they're talking about? Yeah. yeah. And you were like, oh my God, they don't know what they're talking about. They don't really know very much more than me. I think I need to respect them because they have more money. I don't know. Because they have more power. I don't know. But they don't know anything. Oh God. We're all just kind of, you know, bumping into walls here. Um, in a way, I wonder if this is going to make a, an amazing breed of kids that already know that there is comfort and safety not reliant on certainty, that there's a comfort and safety in inner resilience of when you have tried something hard and then seen yourself able to stay alive through it and stay relatively sane through it, then you have such a confidence in yourself. I, I think it's going to be hard, but in a way, I wonder if it's going to make a really interesting breed of kids to already from the outset know no one really knows what they're doing and that's okay. And changing your mind is going to happen a million times. Let's make it safe to do so. 
And what's the thing we can rely on? Our own inner developing wisdom and heart, which is still growing and not perfect yet, but it's something that is always that potential is there. You cannot ruin your potential. You know, you can only develop and expand it. And so you get that inner resiliency that says, I made it through this, I can make it through that. You know, the, the, the worry is that the kids are going to get too fatalistic and apathetic because it feels like everything is falling apart and the world's going to end in flames and they're going to be all alone in a crazy planet that's suffocating them. And why try to do anything? Why have hope? And that, that's the fear, I think, is that there's so much uncertainty and what seems to be true is the world's going to hell, that they'll just kind of collapse into their video games and just wait for it to be over. You know, <laughs> that, that's the worry. And I, and I think that all we can do is model that there is joy with uncertainty, that there is benefit in hope that's not ignorant. You know, there's, there's, there's a benefit in being strategic about making life better for yourself and others. And even if it kind of is like building houses of cards that are always falling down again, that building it is fun, and the falling apart can make you more creative the next time. You know, and that that is kind of what we're doing now is we're just building houses of cards and they're falling down, but we're freaking out every time the house of cards falls. If from the outset we were like, it's a house of cards, it's gonna fall. It wouldn't be so scary, <laughs> you know? And then we build a new one better, you know? I don't know, it's, it's, it's a challenge, but um, I, don't, I don't envy the kids, but in a way I think it's gonna be okay. I think these are going to be some strong little cookies. No, but yeah, what were you going to say? Oh, I was just going to relate to not only realizing that the grown ups don't know what they're talking about, but suddenly realizing I'm a grown up. <laughs> I don't know anything. <laughs> I don't know. Suddenly realizing you're a grown up. <laughs> and, and, and I know nothing. And I also wonder about the children because I wonder at what age they could even. Yeah. I remember my grandson, he must have been about six or seven when he discovered that we all die. Yeah, right. He went through a terrible time of sobbing over it and having a really, really difficult time. And so I wonder when can a child successfully handle this uncertainty that they mm. don't? need from their parents and not and they try to make it and smooth and yeah and uh, even go too far. well at what point can <laughs> yeah at what point can kids handle the the truth <laughs> the whole truth nothing but the truth and 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 i'm you know i'm sure psychologists and brain scientists would have things to say but doesn't it feel true that you can kind of cope with anything if there are people to love you afterwards yeah or during, more importantly, yeah. if there are people who are not lying to you, they're saying, yeah. there's a lot of uncertainty right now. What's true is I care about you. Yeah. There's a lot of things we don't know right now. I will never give up on you. And I feel like that kind of stability, even though you know we can't make complete promises that way, because we could die any day. We could yeah. die from getting hit by a bus. Never mind whatever's happening with the world and the pandemic. You know, people die every day. Yeah. Healthy people die before sick people every day. Young people die before old people every day. It's a thing. So we can't promise I will be here for you forever, but we can promise while I'm here I will always love you. Yeah. Even, you know, there'll be moments of anger that will sort of override it. But, you know, like, I got your back, come what yeah. may. And everybody's got to learn sometime. If it's the right time or the wrong time, I don't know if it helps to think in those terms. I think it helps to more think I'm going to hold them and support them and listen to their fears without feeling like I need to fix it. Because that's some of our pressure of... I don't want them to ask me big, scary questions that I don't know if I can answer. You know, it's like, who's not ready? They might be ready. It's you that not ready. You know, I don't want the six-year-old to ask me about death. Ah, you know, like I can barely talk to myself about it, you know, but if you're thinking, I actually don't have to know all the answers. I don't have to bluff. I don't have to tell them things that aren't true. I can just say, here's some ideas about this, but no one really knows, hun. Yeah. But what I know is I love you, and I bet you're going to figure it out. 
<laughs> you know, <laughs> you can rest on that. Yeah. You can rest on that. But I think it's important to not feel like you have to know the answers because that takes the pressure off. Yeah. Susan. Just really quickly, I want to say Greta Thunberg is an example of a kid who really has her act together. She knows, she accepts that the adults oh, Greta, don't know yeah. what they're talking about and goes to the United Nations and tells them. She's very um, inspiring. Yeah, yeah, go Greta. It's always like, sorry, yeah, you're right, you're right. I'm sorry, yes, I'm sorry for everyone my age and older. I'm so sorry. <laughs> you're right, you're right, kiddo. And um, yeah, we don't need to squash that enthusiasm. It can get us off our get us off our bums because we've kind of gotten a little complacent and just kind of made peace with. I guess this is what we're dealing with now. Uh, let's just you know watch some Netflix and go into a comatose state of disassociation and you know <laughs> snack. And the kids are like, no, <laughs> you know? so they can get us off our bums. <laughs> and thank you for that, <laughs> young people. So, you know, it's a lot, it's a lot to sit with, I understand. And it's things that you, it's not like it's new thoughts, but, but I think this, this framework of, you know, asking yourself logistical or moral or both or neither, and just kind of getting your head around what is my stuck spot or where is my worry? And then, you know, where am I effective? Like, what are my emotions like in each case? what is my level of effectiveness in each case and just kind of getting a bit more strategic and less reactive. Yeah. And, and keep coming back to that point of it is hard for anyone to change their minds about anything. Let's be patient with each other and hold open the, I don't know everything vibe. Cause if you're meeting someone with a, I don't know everything vibe, you don't feel so judged you don't feel so much pressure. Collaboration can open up. And that's really where we wanna go with all of this is the spirit of collaboration of you know pieces and I know pieces and you know pieces and let's talk together rather than making it a fight for dominance or a fight for rightness. It becomes a let's come together and share things and just figure this out together. All right, thanks everyone. Thank you so much, Venerable Yunten, for your precious time that you give us and for all your teachings. We really appreciate you. Um, this event will be happening again, just as a reminder, next month. Um, if you'd like to be on the email list for upcoming events, uh, you can email spc at medicinebuddha.org. I put that in the chat along with the next uh, large big event that Venerable Yunten will be doing. Of course, she has class next Wednesday on the six perfections. Um, also, uh, she'll be leading the White Tara Retreat um, next week and not this coming weekend, but the following weekend, October 16th and 17th. I thank you again, Venerable Yunten, for your precious time. Thanks, guys. Thanks. It's wonderful to see you all. And uh, if you have any requests for topics you'd like us to do, send them to the SPC, send them to Christina, and we can look at it. So I'm open to suggestions. All right. See ya. Thank you. Bye.